And I think that's been enough time. I think most everybody has trickled into our Zoom webinar. Uh, first off, welcome everyone. Uh, we are La Hontan Audubon Society. We are an independent Audubon chapter serving Reno and Northern Nevada. My name is Parker Flickinger and I am the Community Engagement and Marketing Coordinator VISTA. This is the first of our Birds of Truckee Meadows webinar series, a series all about the birds in the Truckee Meadows, Northern Nevada region. Uh, um, before we get started and I introduce our hosts, uh, I'll have some housekeeping tips. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, so when you uh, arrive, you are automatically gonna be muted uh, and you are automatically gonna have your videos off permanently throughout the presentation. Uh, However, there are some interactive features. Uh, we have a chat bar, uh, which you can click on to uh, make comments. And some of the activities will uh, let you make comments on the chat bar. Also, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to click on the Q&A button. It's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, um, click on there and uh, um, type in your question. Uh, we will have a Q&A session uh, at the end of this session. Uh, um, some other news about uh, our chapter. Uh, some of you may have joined us for our art uh, workshops uh, that we've been hosting with uh, Christine Elder and John Muir Laws. Uh, those workshops have been going on and they are still going on. We have one more uh, art workshop presentation with John Muir Laws that's happening next Monday. So if you would like to join that, uh, visit our website, nevadaaudubon.org. Uh, and you can register. It is free and open to everyone. So if you get a chance, definitely check it out. Um, one final housekeeping tip. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar and we are fortunate enough to record this Zoom webinar. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and it will be featured on our YouTube channel afterwards. So uh, if you want to replay any of these uh, concepts we talk about, feel free to uh, visit our website. You can find our YouTube channel there and re-watch this video. And that's all the announcements I've got. So let me introduce our speaker tonight. Our speaker is Ben Sonnenberg. Uh, ben is a PhD candidate at University of Nevada, Reno and works in the Chickadee Behavior Ecology Lab. Ben is a seasoned birder and has participated in many uh, birding events around the area, including the Christmas Bird Count, the Spring Wings Birding Festival, and many of our birding field trips, of which we are uh, eternally grateful for Ben. Uh, so uh, without that, uh, let's take it away, Ben. Awesome, okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, we should be up and rolling with that. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. It's really fun uh, to be here with you guys for the, I forgot that it was the very first um, uh, talk in the lecture series. So this is uh, ex exciting to be here for the first one and thank goodness it's the first one so you can forget about it, you know, uh, as you, um, uh, watch more uh, in the series and get to learn more about birds in this particular region. So yeah, again, I'm a graduate student at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I uh, study behavioral ecology, specifically the behavior of mountain chickadees in the area. Uh, and, but today we're going to be talking about vocalizations and birding by ear. And uh, even though I don't study vocalization specifically in my work, uh, I absolutely love spending time uh, birding uh, and birding by ear, and we'll be sharing with you um, some of my um, uh, adventures as we go on. And so because we aren't out in the woods, tromping around, um, pointing to the tops of trees and saying, do you hear that up there? No, it's over there. No, do you hear that? No, it's over there. It's up there. Uh, because we don't get to be actually out in the woods experiencing birdsong in person. I just wanted to outline some of the goals of this presentation and some of the things that I hope that we can all take away um, in order to make our birding experience better. And so the goal 
the first goal is just to get to the basics. So what are we listening for? So when we go out into the woods specifically to listen to birds, or if we go out into the woods to listen to nature, um, what are we listening for? Where should we listen? Um, what types of sounds are we hearing? Uh, how to make sense of those types of sounds? And birding by ear is a really essential skill uh, that can really greatly enrich everyone's birding experience. Uh, it can also make you really annoying to be around, especially if you're outside trying to hold a conversation because out one ear you say, okay, that's, I think there's a pine siskin over there on the top of that tree. Uh, it, so we all, it's a wonderful skill, but it might take over your life. It's just, it's rewarding. Uh, but many of these small birds that we're after or really want to get uh, to see are dwelling in the high, tops of the highest trees, right? And they're up in the canopies, they're difficult to see, but they're much more easily heard. And once you know that a species is there, you can be patient and wait and maybe actually get a visual look at some of the species too, but sometimes you might not even get a visual look. And so that's why uh, burning by ear and learning what kind of sounds to look and listen for um, uh, can really uh, enhance the burning experience. So we're gonna be talking about all sorts of types of sounds like trills and buzzes, uh, mechanical sounds that birds make. We're gonna be talking about bird songs, bird calls. Um, and the other thing that I wanna really point out that listening uh, to the soundscapes that we're around uh, as we go out into nature, one of the things that we can really glean from the types of sounds is um, what's going on uh, behaviorally. So if a bird is singing, what does that mean uh, about the behavior of the bird? If we hear a woodpecker drumming, what can we expect to see and where should we look for that woodpecker? Um, and so sometimes, we can know what a bird is up to by just hearing it and sometimes by from quite a distance away. And lastly, we're gonna specifically talk about how to record birds. And so uh, I'm an enthusiast that runs around and tries to record birds that I'm listening to in a digital form and save it and to study it for later. And I'm just gonna brush over some of the ways that people are going about that and some of the tools that we can use and some of the tools that you can use um, that you might already own and have in your pocket uh, to record some of the birds that you might be seeing uh, in the Truffy Meadows area. And so the other thing, because this talk is being recorded, I just wanted to point out that I'm actually using all of my own media today. And so because this is a talk that's specifically targeted at learning about the birds of Truckee Meadows and the birds of the Truckee Meadows region, I tried to include all sorts of um, examples of individual species that sing specific songs in specific ways, um, but all from birds that have actually been recorded in this area. So this is a Lincoln Sparrow uh, up in uh, Tahoe Meadows, and this is its matching. Uh, this is a spectrogram, which is just a visual representation of its song. And so we're going to be seeing a lot more of that just as we go along. Okay, so many of you guys might think that deep, tall, deciduous woods are um, uh, a habitat that is extremely challenging to see birds. And that, okay, well, when I go into the woods, I don't see a thing, I hear a lot of birds, how can I see them better? Or how can I learn what they are and who's making all those vocalizations? But I will say that even in habitats like this um, uh, open wetland, uh, learning, all these different vocalizations, even if a bird is only partially obscured by vegetation, can be extremely helpful at locating birds. And so I want you guys to use uh, the chat feature if you can. And I'm going to just, so first of all, just looking over this landscape, I see a few humans kind of like way over here off in the distance, um, uh, but I don't see any birds. But now let's listen. Maybe. Can you not hear that, guys? Uh, no, we don't hear let's, it right now. Let's see. Well, that's the sound is on. Okay. Maybe we're just a little slow. We can. Really? Uh, we can see your uh, um, uh, presenter notes right now. Yeah, thank you. That's gonna 
Share again and share my second screen here. Yeah, we're sharing for sound. Okay, let's try this again. We're just a little, oh, oh, there we go. We're just a little frozen. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, um, just to remind you, right, I mentioned earlier, as we were looking out over this landscape, we couldn't hear any, or we couldn't see any birds, right? But so now, as I, I'm going to play the recording a little bit again. And I want you guys to listen and to see if you recognize um, uh, any of the vocalizations and see if you can recognize how many species are in the recording. Okay, so if folks don't mind using the chat feature, um, uh, let's see, does anybody recognize there's a witchity, witchity, witchity in the chat, which is an excellent mnemonic for uh, the common yellow throat, which is a warbler species. <laughs> oh yeah, so we got the yellow headed blackbird, red winged blackbird, yeah, absolutely. Three of those species. Uh, yep, absolutely. There's a marsh wren singing as well. And so once we actually start listening to the soundscape, right, of this particular habitat, even though we can't see uh, any of the species, um, we begin to hear many of them. And so the marsh wren might be over here singing wildly. There might be a red-winged blackbird that pops up and begins to sing over here. Um, and there's a western meadowlark that was singing, uh, and then a kind of hard to hear and a little bit subtle in the background was a morning dove. And so the more that we listen and just sitting in one place, that was only about um, uh, 30 to 45 seconds of just sitting and listening um, in one place. And maybe at the start, we only saw a red winged blackbird, but after sitting there, we can see, we can hear, and then know to look for um, uh, six. Uh, to even seven uh, more species of the birds around us. Uh, so listening and just patience in listening is, uh, can be extremely valuable. And so now um, uh, I'm going to just talk about what we can be listening for and the types of songs that we could be listening for and the types of notes that we should be listening for. And um, uh, this will help us when we're out in the woods, and just like if you were to see a bird that you might not recognize, and you have a field notebook or you have something to take notes on, you can say, okay, well, I see that it has a white throat. Uh, it might have a long tail. It might have uh, relatively short wings. It might have wing bars. You can write some of those hints down and then you can go consult your field guide um, uh, at the end of the day uh, and try to discern what species you saw. And so this can be done for vocalizations as well. And so repeated notes. So how many notes were in the song? Were there a lot? Um, uh, were they the same note? Were they, was it repeating the same note over and over and over again? Was it doing it fast? Or was it singing slowly? Um, there's all sorts of different things that we can begin to pay attention to about song um, that will help us identify uh, the specific species that might be singing. And so and the last thing is the frequency of the notes. And so what I mean by frequency is whether or not they're high pitched, so a higher frequency note versus a lower frequency note. And so let's actually give an example. And so uh, I showed a spectrogram earlier on the slide of the Lincoln Sparrow, uh, but a spectrogram is a visual representation of a sound. And this might be helpful because many birders, uh, as and I've had this case with some of the students that I've worked with in the past, 
that are extremely, you know, for a good birder, and we study birds a lot, and we study their visual identification characteristics, um, uh, we're good visual learners, right? We're using our vision to learn all of these things. And auditory learning is harder, and it's just a different skill. Um, the great thing about spectrograms is that we can actually kind of unite some of our visual, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, visual skills uh, and our auditory skills. And so a spectrogram is a visual representation of a sound. And so on the y-axis right here is the frequency of, of the sound. And so the dark um, uh, marks uh, on this gray background here are the actual notes. And so right here is the note. And so depending on how high it is on this axis, on the y-axis, it's the higher frequency of the note. So if it's way up high or way down low, right? Um, uh, that's the frequency. And then down here on the x-axis is the time. And so the time we can basically use this axis to say how fast are these notes being sung, uh, how close notes are together, and scientists use spectrograms in order to really analyze and break down different songs and actually see things, uh, if you will, in vocalizations that cannot be perceived by our own um, uh, hearing. And so let me just play. So this is, uh, this is a spectrogram of me. Uh, and so this is a spectrogram of me whistling in arpeggio. And so you can see uh, as I whistle, I go up in frequency and come down. And then I'm staying on the same pitch for most of these until at the very end where I give it a little bit of a whistle. And so spectrograms really help us visualize that vocalization. So these are big, long, beautiful, um, uh, well, I shouldn't compliment myself, I guess, but um, uh, these are long whistled notes that you can see rise in frequency and then fall back in frequency. And so this is a lovely phrased song which we'll talk about who sings phrased song in birds here in a minute. Okay, so just as a test for those of you um, uh, who just maybe had their first experience with a spectrogram, let's analyze these two next spectrograms before we actually jump into a few of the different song types that we could be listening for in our woods around here in Nevada. And so this one looks very similar to the whistled notes in the last slide, and it sings two notes here and two notes again. So let's listen to it. Okay, in the chat, does anybody know what the heck that bird is? <clears throat> let's do it again. Anybody want to offer up an answer? Awesome. Yes, the cheeseburger bird, the cheeseburger. So the mountain chickadee, absolutely. Alan Kubonik got it too. That's surprising. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, so this is a mountain chickadee song. So you can see that it sings uh, the same note twice, a short note and then a long note, and then two relatively long notes on a different pitch. So absolutely. Okay, so now that would, uh, mountain chickadees have a relatively simple song. So let's now listen to a little bit more complicated song. Awesome, so any guesses on this one? So this is a little bit more complex of a song. have repeated buzzy notes. Okay, awesome, yeah. So we got the right answer in the chat. So this is a marsh wren. Um, and we can, much more complex marsh wrens, especially here in Western North America, have relatively large repertoire, which means that they have all sorts of different songs that they sing, and they sing them um, uh, in different situations, and they go through them to show how great they are. Um, uh, at being songsters. Awesome. And so those are a few examples of using spectrograms <clears throat> and visualizing song. My PowerPoint froze a little bit again. There we go. Okay, so now we're specifically going to talk about song. And so as we go through, I'm going to specifically, we're going to talk about all sorts of different sounds that birds make. Um, we're going to start with song, we're going to start with, and we're going to move on to other noises that kind of fill the same function as song, 
um, but on its own, uh, that are different um, different types of noises in the woods. And then we're going to move on to calls, and we're going to specifically talk about how we can identify each of the two, or each of the different types of noises, how we can identify them, what they mean in that bird's behavior, and um, uh, as well as the, yeah, the different functions of those things, the different song functions between song and calls. And so song uh, has uh, many songsters, there's seasonality to the song. And so birds are using song for mate attraction and for territory maintenance. And so for when species like uh, yellow rump warbler arrive at my field site up in the Sierra Nevada after spending a leisurely winter in Reno, they fly up and they begin singing in specific habitat patches. And they're using that to attract females. And they're using that also to tell the other males in the surrounding area, this patch is mine. And many songs are really useful for birding and for birding by ear because they are diagnostic to species. So you can hear an individual singing a song and you absolutely know that is a yellow rumped warbler. And some of the downsides to call vocalizations is that there are some calls that are relatively, that are shared. So there are multiple species that make the same um, vocalization uh, and they can be mistaken for other species. And so, uh, but song is not one of those. And so song can be used for um, identifying to specific species. Um, <clears throat> and normally it occurs in the summer and then spring when birds are actively attracting mates when they're getting ready to reproduce. Uh, though we, you can hear white crowned sparrows around the Reno area in the wintertime practicing song um, as they uh, solidify it in their brains. So we're going to be talking about uh, some of the specific song types. And so first, uh, in the components of song, I should say, and we're going to go through specific examples of some of the species that sing um, uh, those types of songs. And so the first one is a trill. And so I said before that the uh, types of notes and the uh, amounts of notes and whether or not they're repeated and how fast they're repeated are all really important to um, uh, identifying a song type. And so this is a female dark-eyed jumper, as you can see. And so it's rare that these guys do sing. And it's mostly males that do sing, but more and more we're learning that there are many species in which females sing as well as the males. A lot of times, not as much, um, but they do sing. And then there are some really unique examples where males and females actually duet with one another. And so pair bonding, they both sing and singing together is really important. Uh, so this is a female type though. And so, and this song is from a male, but you know, forget about that. Um, but this is a trill right here. And so let's just look at the spectrogram first before we listen. And so there's a few, you can see that there's just the exact same looking uh, marks on the spectrogram. Uh, here, there's three of them here, and then it goes into this long stretch of the same note, and they're really close together, which means that they're being sung very quickly, and then it ends with two short notes here. And so let's listen to it. Awesome. And so dark-eyed juncos are trillers, which means that they, in this case, have a few introductory notes, but then they sing the same note um, over and over again in very fast succession. So they're singing the same note and quickly, and that is what defines a trill. And there are a lot of sparrow species um, here in Nevada that sing songs that contain trills, like the dark-eyed junco. Uh, and there's numerous others. And I have another example on the next slide, uh, which is this lovely chipping sparrow. And so chipping sparrows recently got back to Reno. They're a migrant, and so they flew in um, relatively recently. And they have a little bit of a different trill song. And so you, you can see those repeated notes again. And we don't have the introductory notes this time, but let's listen to this one. And so this trilled song is like really uh, almost sounds like an insect, um, but like I said, very, very fast sung notes. So they're sung very, very quickly back to back and they're the exactly the same note. And so that's what defines a trill. And so when you hear vocalizations like the ones we just listened to, those are trills and you can narrow down 
on uh, some of the species that you might be listening to, whether or not they're trilling or not. And so the next type of song are, it's called um, a phrase song. And so phrases are um, songs. Uh, so for example, metal arts sing phrase songs in which there are different notes. So um, uh, we just looked at notes that were sung, they look exactly the same. Um, uh, these have different notes. And so I whistled a phrase earlier today and metal larks sing all sorts of different notes um, uh, in a different arranged order, but not at a great speed. So let's listen to that one more time. And so you can see from our spectrogram, here's a note, this is a new note, this is another new note, and then it changes again, it goes up in frequency, and then every single mark on this spectrogram is a little bit different. So all of these are unique notes, they're singing them, and then across the time, they're singing them rather slow, so we can kind of hear and differentiate each separate note, and that's a phrase. And there's a lot of species that sing phrased songs. Um, and so metal arcs are really, um, extremely loud, right? And they're pretty common in this area. And so they're a really wonderful songster that you can step out your back door um, uh, and hear. And so listen to those guys. And they also do warble on occasion. And so it's uh, listening to a bird sing through its full repertoire. Um, so all of its songs that it has um, is also really rewarding. And so listen to the metal arcs and all they have to offer. And so then warbling song, and I have warbling song up here and you might think to yourself, well, gall, golly, Ben, uh, we have lots of uh, warblers in Nevada. Um, maybe some of you have seen black sort of gray warblers, Townsend's warblers, Nashville warblers uh, passing through. Well, it turns out that our North American warbles do not have warbling song. They actually sing phrased song. But some of the species that do have warbling song are species like this male cassin spinch. And so warbling songs, very similar to phrase songs, have all sorts of unique different notes. But in this case, phrases are sung a little bit more slowly and we can differentiate each note as the bird sings. Uh, warbling song is not the same. Warbling song is extremely quick. Um, uh, and fast, and sometimes we cannot differentiate between the notes, and it sounds slurry and quick. And so let's listen to this Cassin's Finch male. And so uh, if you've heard house finches in your yard as well, they are another species of finch that warble. And so seeing a big diversity of notes very, very quickly. And so you can see some repeated notes like even right here in this song. And so that's um, all of these components that I've just gone over like warbles, um, warbling type song and trills. We have some species like the marsh wren that work in um, uh, phrases in uh, as well, uh, into their song as well as trills. And so that, that's why having a spectrogram is really helpful and so that we can actually visualize and see some of the things going on and so we know what to listen for. And then the last one that I just wanted to highlight that could be really confusing is that there are some mimics out there that have really uh, complex, amazing songs, but can sometimes sing um, the vocalizations of other species. And so for the Northern Mockingbird, that is a very common occurrence. And so here it is, uh, so mostly they are singing a mix of warbling song and trills. So they're singing a lot of diversity of notes really, really fast, but then they switch over and they repeat um, uh, one specific vocalization, sometimes something like a killdeer, something like a greater yellow legs, a vocalization that they've actually heard and learned from another species. And in this case, I want you to listen really closely. He mimics another species at the end, and I want to see if folks can hear that other species. Does anybody recognize <clears throat> what's in the very end? I'll give one hint. It's not another bird. So we can listen again, maybe. Does 
anybody want to take a wild guess? Well, I can just tell you guys. So he's actually, he's riveting. So he's mimicking a frog. And so listen right here at the very end. So there's some notes. Ribbit, 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 ribbit. <laughs> And so if you hear a frog in a location that a frog might not be located, it could be a northern mockingbird. Um, and so this is a species that has extremely rich, large repertoires and has the ability to learn others songs, which is not the case for all birds. And so we just talked a lot about the basic components of some of the songs that you might hear. And so now when you step into the woods uh, and you hear maybe a song that you don't recognize, um, listen for trills, listen for warbles, listen for phrase songs, and that can help you whether or not those phrases are made out of whistle notes or buzzy notes, that can help you narrow down um, some of the species um, uh, that it could be based upon your habitat that you're in. And so, for example, Ictrids, so blackbirds, meadowlarks, orioles, um, uh, blackbirds have polyphonic trills, so that's why they're tweedles. Um, have a particular quality because polyphonic means multi-tonal, so they're able to produce multiple frequency uh, frequencies at the same time in their trills. Uh, metal larks, as you guys heard earlier, have beautiful phrase songs, and then they sometimes also have warbling songs. Um, Bullock's orioles have whistled phrases that are interrupted with kind of nasal chatter. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, perulids, so these guys right here, perulidae, so our um, uh, warbler species, they sing, they don't sing warbling song. They actually have buzzy phrase songs. Uh, and then vireos have whistled note phrases. And so these guys can sound pretty similar, uh, but a lot of times vireos have beautiful, um, more pure, less buzzy whistled notes to their songs. And a lot of the times they're asking questions. So it's like, where am I? I am here. And they answer themselves, which is something to listen for when you're out in the woods, especially as the Cassin's Vireos are arriving and they should be um, uh, uh, all around us uh, up in the coniferous forest as we speak, probably going to bed. Uh, and then Tyranidae, so it's a family that uh, has lots of, it's a flycatcher family, and it has Epidinax flycatchers. And so this is a picture of a female dusky flycatcher sitting on her nest. And why I included this picture, and I want to specifically point out um, uh, flycatchers, is that flycatchers have a very, their, it's, their song is very strongly genetically controlled. They don't learn their song. Once they hatch, they grow up. Once they mature, they just begin to sing. And that um, uh, there's um, less variation in their song sometimes than there is in the plumage of the bird. And so if you're having a really hard time IDing in Pitonax flycatchers, so species like dusky flycatchers versus gray flycatchers versus um, some of these other species that migrate through, like Hammond's flycatchers, listening to them vocalizing in the spring um, is much more reliable in order to identify them to species uh, than actually sometimes looking at their plumage. And we can argue a lot about that until we're blue in the face, but um, uh, there's uh, song is the, one of the most important um, uh, things for that particular family. And then Fringillidae is the finch family. And so uh, diverse fast warbling song like the house finches and like that Cassin's finch that we listened to earlier today uh, in the presentation rather. And so then there's all sorts of other sounds out there. Um, and there's a few uh, specific sounds that I wanna point out that really uh, that fill the same function as song. And those are, a uh, few of those are mechanical sounds, like the winnowing of this Wilson's snipe. And so Wilson's snipe, when they're display, displaying in early April, will do uh, flight displays where they fly high up in the air and then they dive and they open their tail and the vibration of their tail feathers creates a winnowing noise. And so that's kind of a, it's a messy recording. There's a lot of background noise there, but you can hear the whoa, 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 noise in the background. And that is actually the vibration of uh, this Wilson snipe feather. So let me listen to it one more time here. 
And so birds are amazing. They don't just produce sounds with their vocal apparatuses. They also produce mechanical sounds, you know, with feathers, with their beaks, uh, and those can be used to attract mates. And so I've actually been birding in the early, early morning, walking around a wet, damp field and heard that high over my head before it got light. And I was like, what the heck is that? Um, and so it doesn't really sound like a bird. And so recording some of those sounds uh, for future listening and for future identification uh, can be really helpful, for, especially for some of these really tricky vocalizations um, that might not immediately sound like a bird. So there are more uh, species of birds that have uh, dynamic flight displays that result in vocalizations. And one that I'll highlight, uh, they're one group that specifically has a lot of diverse noises that they produce during their uh, courtship displays are hummingbirds. And they do so in a similar fashion to Wilson Snipe. When they dive and open their tail, they produce a particular buzz note as their tail feathers vibrate. And this calliope hummingbird um, uh, makes a really funny noise. Um, uh, and so this is, if you listen, it almost sounds like a sneeze. And so this little buzz right here that we can see on our spectrogram is actually that those tail feathers um, uh, after they uh, finish their diving display. So then that's used to attract females and they also do, you know, this acrobatic dive. Um, and so the sound as well as that expenditure of energy doing that uh, particular display helps these males attract females. And so if you hear kind of an insect sound in the woods, especially if you're at maybe Davis Creek uh, Park around the pond, stop and look for these uh, small hummingbirds. You could actually be listening to some of their portrait displays. And then one of my favorites is drumming. Uh, and woodpeckers uh, find hollowed out trees uh, or dead, large dead um, uh, branches of trees that uh, resonate well. And so they vibrate well. And they will go find these items and will peck them, but they peck them in a particular um, uh, rhythm. And that rhythm, um, uh, is very much fulfills a similar uh, function to song, and it's used to mate attraction and to ward off other competing male woodpeckers from the territory. And so this is a red-breasted sapsucker from Davis Creek Park, and I caught him drumming the other day. And so some woodpeckers, you can barely, you know, it sounds like a very solid, steady um, uh, rhythm and it looks like a trill. There's very much um, a specific, really fast um, separation between their different um, uh, pecks. Uh, but sapsuckers are really fun because they actually have an offset to their drum. So they sound da 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 rather than da 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 They say da 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 And so if you're out listening, you can, let's listen one more time and listen for that little hiccup. right at the beginning, da -da, da 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 And so sapsuckers, if you hear that particular offset, that's a sapsucker and he's drumming. And if you hear that noise, stop, look around, look for a large tree with dead hollow limbs uh, and just slowly approach that tree because listening to that sound, you know that it's a woodpecker, you know that it's drumming and you know that it needs a specific device to help it drum, this old tree. And so it can help you better find that particular individual woodpecker. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about a few, uh, well, so there's a huge diversity of calls, which is just another large categorization of some of the vocalizations that birds produce. And calls have all sorts of functions. So some uh, individuals, you know, calls are really intricate uh, uh, for pair bonding. Uh, sometimes it's used for flock cohesion. So for example, like uh, this flock of mostly Western sandpiper uh, flying around. Uh, together, right? How the heck do they do it? Well, they are vocalizing, constantly communicating with each other, uh, knowing where to go next. So it's also been shown that sometimes in specific species, uh, specific individuals have specific calls. So it's basically like saying somebody's name, say, hey, Bill, right? That's um, specific species have specific calls to the individual. And then it can also be used 
Uh, and we can't discern that, but it's been shown that other birds can perceive that um, uh, and can use that for um, uh, daily life and maintaining relationships as they do. And then sometimes calls uh, can, um, there's specific calls that correspond to specific sub subspecific variation. And so uh, I'll specifically talk about an example of that, but what essentially that means is that, and there, this takes place in song as well, uh, but some song stirs out there have dialects. And so a most common example of that is white crown sparrows. So in the winter time, we mostly around here in the Reno area have a subspecies that sings one particular song, but they migrate and they leave the area. We then have another subspecies that migrates in and nests at high elevation areas like Tahoe Meadows. And they actually have a little bit different plumage and they actually sing a different dialect of song. And some specific subspecies actually have calls that show where they're from, or at least that um, uh, those are specific to um, their subspecies. And I'll give you a few examples of what that looks like and how we know that that's the case. But calls are very, very diverse. And so I'm only gonna give you a few examples. But one of the downsides of calls is that many times um, uh, they can't be used specifically to identify a species, but sometimes they can. And so uh, for example, in finches, and I'll give two examples of this. And so this is the example of how some species can actually be identified to um, a specific kind of, it's not a, truly a subspecies, but it's um, a variation that we have in a species. And so red crossbill is a good example. So this right here is a red crossbill um, that I found in Lake Tahoe area. And this is a type two crossbill uh, that specializes on ponderosa pine nuts. And how the heck do I know that? Well, I know that because I recorded it calling. And there are, are around 10 call types of North American red crossbills. They all call a very specific call. And that call is associated with different morphology. And so there's some crossbills that are smaller and some that are larger than others, and they produce different vocalizations. And we still don't know exactly how those vocalizations arose, um, but a lot of it is thought to do with the fact that they specialize on different conifer cone types. And so for example, small, um, uh, uh, subspecies of red crossbill, uh, like type threes, specialize on uh, western and, and eastern hemlock, which are tiny, tiny uh, little cones that they use their cross bills in order to open. Uh, but some species like the subspecies like this giant type two have really big muscles and their jaw and really big beaks in order to handle these giant pine nuts. Cones. And that, so we believe that this difference in size and shape and musculature has led to these different um, uh, vocalizations as well. And then that allows them to tell each other apart. And so then why is that important? Well, so let's first look at the spectrogram and hear a red crossbill. And so I like to say that they're saying kip, 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 kip. Um, uh, and so that's the shorthand, you know, human, my poorly mimicked red crossbill. But you can see that the vocalization has a really specific shape. And so it almost looks like a little squiggly line, right? If we look at the shape right here. And um, some people can actually hear red crossbill types and say, ooh, that's a type three or that's a type two. I cannot. I have to record a red crossbill and actually look at the morphology of the sound on a spectrogram in order to say, oh, that's a type two red crossbill. And so why are calls like this important? Well, red crossbills actually use these vocalizations to update their flock mates on how well they're foraging. And so if they're on a pine tree and they're eating pine nuts, one might start calling. And if they start calling, that means that they're not having great foraging success. So it's like, hey, Bill, this cafeteria stinks, right? And so they call, and then maybe another one isn't having good foraging success. So you hear one call, then another call, and then another call, and then another call, and it gets louder and louder, and it's a crescendo. And then you can actually watch flocks take off together. And so they say, let's go find a new tree. And why it's important to have um, call types that are specific to these, uh, to variation, say, in the bill size, is that these guys specialize on ponderosa pine. And so when these guys take off and go find other foraging resources, they want to stay together as a flock to find foraging resources that they can all benefit from. And so then they travel around in these groups. 
And another example of birds that do this, do this are actually evening grosbeaks. And so uh, I've actually found two different call types of evening grosbeaks in the Reno area. One last year in April, which was um, uh, a call type that was supposed to be up in uh, like the Pacific Northwest area, but it was visiting our area. So we really appreciated it. Uh, and then this is the other one that we normally um, uh, view. So let's listen to them both. And then let's actually look at the spectrogram and see the physical differences between the vocalizations. So let's pause there. I'm actually going to go to the spot. Okay. Oh, it's not going to do a photo. Okay. Well, let's look at this one anyway. Now let's listen. So this was one call type, and now let's listen to this other one. And so they have, um, they sound different, and actually the sounds look different as well. And so if we look at this one, this is kind of like a squiggly little S, and there are some, right, that start with like a little, uh, it goes up and then back down. And this one is more like a broad upside down U. And maybe from our ears, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but because we were able to like record these birds and look at them on spectrograms, we can actually tell that they're different um, uh, call types or just different variation within the species. And so sometimes it, like um, uh, this diversity in vocalizations uh, can be hidden. Um, and so, um, auditory and ear, birding by ear can open up a whole new world of diversity once we start paying attention. And then just because there's so much fun, uh, we should highlight some of our jays. Uh, in particular, the pinion jay, which is near and dear to many of our hearts out here. It's such a special bird and we appear to have a relatively reliable population around. Uh, and they make these really funny nasal contact calls. And there, they have amazing looking spectrograms. And so here's one of their spectrograms. <laughs> and so I think it sounds like maniacal laughter. Um, uh, but you can see, so now we have multiple lines above these same notes. And so when you see a vocalization like this, and my friends have a lot of vocalizations like this too, it's essentially these birds are kind of like singing through their nose, if you will. So this is a really nasal vocalization. So a lot of jays, like Stellar's jays, um, you know, California scrub jays, all of these birds have really nasally uh, vocalizations and show, show it on uh, spectrograms like this. And so really pretty unique looking and sounding vocalizations. And then uh, we have some that you might not think of as making a lot of noise. If uh, some of you spend a lot of time in uh, wetlands looking at migrating shorebirds, you might have had the headache before of trying to distinguish between a long build and a short build dowager, which are very, very similar in size. And unfortunately, you can't use the length of the bill um, as a reliable indicator of what species you're looking at. And many shorebirds do have specific vocalizations, but a lot of them are quite silent uh, most of the time, especially while they're foraging. Um, but uh, sometimes when they do vocalize, say in flight, when they're um, moving from a foraging patch, we can hear some of their vocalizations. And short builds versus long build dashers actually sound quite different. And so we can listen for some of these vocalizations to help us identify these hard to find. Um, uh, hard to identify species. It's similar to the Epidonax flycatcher, except these are calls. And like I said, so in some cases, calls are diagnostic. Uh, sometimes they're not. But in this case, calls are absolutely diagnostic. And so let's listen. So he's going to sound like a little uh, laser gun. So he's going to say pew, 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 pew. And so this is the vocalizations of short bill gouger, which can be extremely useful for identification. Just one more time, because it's fun. Okay, awesome. And so then there's another aspect um, that is gaining more of a following of recording birds and listening to vocalizations, and that's this nocturnal flight calls community. 
And so, believe it or not, uh, songbirds and many shorebirds migrate at night. And so, and then some birds, like this common poor will uh, up on Peavine, uh, vocalize at night. And you can record them with specific microphones. And some of these nocturnal flight calls that are actually diagnostic to species. And so, you can sit a microphone up on your roof, uh, have a wonderful night's sleep, and record all sorts of the migrating calls of these neotropical migrants as they make their way north to Canada, some of them anyway, uh, towards their breeding grounds. And you can actually uh, identify them to species and be birding while you're asleep. So just in case people didn't know that you could bird while you sleep, well, by gosh, you can. And so some of the resources if folks are really interested in going down this road are there's a gentleman who um, puts together these microphones and teaches you how to construct a microphone and shows you his setup and he's been doing this for a long time and you can visit his website www.wilbur.org. And then if you simply want to look at the diversity of some of the calls and the songs, there's uh, a blog that's run by uh, Nathan Piccolo called earbirding.com and he actually published two North American field guides on the, so the field guide to bird sounds of North America. And so this is the Eastern one that I have in my hand, but there's an Eastern and a Western guide and um, that have spectrograms inside that you can learn uh, from those spectrograms um, and learn to identify some of these um, calls. And so I, I've just given you a lot of information. This might have been some of the first time that folks have been seeing spectrograms. Maybe those of you who's used eBird, you've uploaded a vocalization before and they automatically create your sound file into a spectrogram, so you might have seen them. Um, but I've been saying, oh yeah, use spectrograms, right? To uh, learn some of these birds and to study some of these sounds in order to you know, see the structure of these sounds. Well, where the heck do I find sounds like this? And there's a couple of amazing resources that are absolutely free and open to the public, such as eBirding or eBird.com. And so if you look um, uh, in their media libraries and search specifically for sounds, you can look up the specific vocalization and the types of vocalization. If you want to listen to a song or a call of one particular species, maybe of a cedar waxwing, for example, you can do that on eBird. And you can do the same for uh, on a website called xenocanto.org. And just like eBird that you can contribute sounds to, you can also contribute sounds to Xeno. Uh, and then, of course, you can always purchase some of these field guides. So I just had a book in my hand. So some of the Peterson field guides, they also make uh, digital versions. So you can actually download a bunch of these sounds and listen to them. Same for the Stokes guides. And then you can also have a digital field guide just on your phone as well. But then I also wanted to say, that you can also record your own sound. So this is an embarrassing picture of me and my wife uh, when we were doing research during our undergraduate in uh, the Oregon area. And we were recording actually the call types of red crossbills. And each of us is holding these giant things, uh, which are parabolic microphones attached to these big digital recording devices. And you don't necessarily have to have, I guess, um, a fancy setup like this. Everyone should, I'm just saying that right now. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to have a fancy microphone. You can actually record birds simply by using your phone. And there's all sorts of applications that you can download that are free. For iPhone users, you can use your voice memo application. There's um, uh, applications that I believe are free, such as Song Sleuth, that are available both on Apple and Android phones. Um, uh, I believe. And then some that are a little bit more specific, like RecForge 2, which I believe is Android only, but that might have changed. They've been updating and building software like this all the time. And this basically, this is what I use. I use RecForge 2 a lot, which is just a device on my phone that I can adjust the microphone sensitivity on, and I can whip out my phone and record some of these vocalizations that are around me in my environment. Say, if I'm on the walk on UNR campus and I don't have my microphone. Uh, but then there's also different types of microphones like directional and parabolic microphones and all sorts of different digital audio recorders. And um, uh, I have some of those with me uh, because like I am a nut. So I have something like this, which is a, this is actually a mini parabolic microphone that I used to record. And mini parabolic microphones are excellent because they allow you to target specific individual birds. So this dish right here allows you to capture and it actually amplifies 
um, the vocalization of a distant bird. It helps you pinpoint a specific individual. Plus, you can bird through it and see your bird at the same time you record it. Um, uh, there's also other types of mics that are a little bit more affordable, like this directional mic right here that you can use to record birds. And there's cheap ones that you can find online that directly attach to your cell phone. And so if you want a directional mic to put in your back pocket that will give you higher quality audio recordings that hook up directly to your cell phone, um, uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely possible. And I'll go back to my screen real fast. <clears throat> So there's lots of resources out there and uh, ways uh, to record vocalizations around you. And my slideshow froze again. There we go, okay. And there's ways to actually look at um, uh, some of these sounds uh, in a, that's absolutely free. So there's this software called Audacity uh, that you can download or Raven where you can download um, uh, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that you can buy more advanced versions that have a little bit of a cost, but then Audacity, which is free, and you can process and edit these vocalizations. And so then these are, this is a vocalization of a black-headed grosbeak that I recorded uh, a couple of days ago at Rancho San Rafael in Reno. And then you can look at these vocalizations um, before you upload and edit them and edit out car noise or screaming children or barking dogs or whatever the case may be. And then you can upload and share your sightings with eBird, iNaturalist, or Sino Canto. And then I would probably be beaten up if I didn't mention this, but I specifically didn't mention it until now because um, uh, it's still a developing software. But there's all sorts of new technologies out there. And Merlin has a, a relatively reliable app, the Merlin app, that you can hold your phone up in the woods uh, and it will tell you what the specific bird that you're listening to is. And sometimes, it definitely makes errors. And so do not necessarily fully put all of your trust in Merlin. Take your sounds home and study them and use your field guides to confirm Merlin's guesses. Um, but you know, Merlin's basically cheating. So you should uh, use it sparingly, uh, I would say, or use it at least uh, to help you get started and help you uh, develop some of these skills that you'll be able to take. And so you can record all of these things and please contribute. So contributing them to these large databases are really helpful because scientists are looking for high quality recordings all the time. I actually recently just saw a request from a biologist that was searching for uh, brewer's sparrow songs. And so run up to the top of Peavine and record some brewer's sparrow songs and send it away because that can be helpful just in the helping us further understand uh, the diversity around us and help us preserve the diversity and help us understand birds better. And after that, I think that's all I have to share with you tonight. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or go back and visit, revisit any vocalizations, et cetera. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, yes, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please type them in the Q&A uh, bar uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, or uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, uh, type them in the comments section and uh, we will ask them in a moment. Well, have you heard any good birds lately, Parker? Yes, actually, there is a uh, northern mockingbird that just uh, moved into uh, my backyard and uh, I've been enjoying hearing it. And we have a question right now. Uh, um, the first question is, are you familiar with Larkwire? Yeah. Uh, hi, Alan. I hope you're well. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, uh, and I, I am familiar with Larkwire. Um, Larkwire, I believe, comes, you have to pay for Larkwire. So it's not a free um, available software, but it's similar in that you record birds and it helps you identify birds, if I remember. But I don't use Lark, I haven't, I've been shown Larkwire before, but I don't personally use Larkwire. And um, and so I use, um, uh, so for my, I can show you an example of the software that I use and why I use it. And uh, so uh, first, just because it's fun, I'll show you what Song Sleuth looks like. And so Song Sleuth is, we might have to, 
uh, unblur my screen here. Um, so here is, this is what, oh, it's already recording me. That was excellent. Um, so if I open up my SongSleuth app, um, uh, it's gonna start recording and actually show me a spectrogram. So if I were to start whistling, right, you can actually see it as you record the bird. And so you can hold your um, uh, phone up and actually see the recording, and then you can save this recording and edit it later on your uh, computer, et cetera. So like, those are the ones that I prefer, but um, uh, uh, LarkWire, oh yeah, and Alan's right. It's also, you can use it to quiz yourself um, uh, uh, to help remember and learn. Um, uh, and eBird also has a quizzing option. So you can sign up and you can load a specific area um, uh, and uh, listen to species that you need a little bit of help on if you're a little bit rusty. But that's right. Thanks, Alan. I, I'd forgotten that that was also, yeah. But I believe you still have, you have to pay for it too. So. Our next question says, do you have an audio of a long-billed dowager call? Yeah. By golly, I do. Uh, I'm gonna try to play it um, uh, into my laptop speaker. So Parker, you can report whether or not it's, you know, tolerable. Did you hear that okay? Yeah, so that's, you can hear, so they sound um, uh, like a lot of other like smaller peeps. Uh, versus the short bill, um, uh, which sounds like, you know, he's shooting the little laser gun. And so those, those are side-by-side -side comparisons of those two species. Wonderful. Thank you for doing that. Uh, our next question is, what species do you know of that have male and female singing duets? Um, there's a few species of fairy wren um, uh, that sing together, uh, which are good examples. I don't have an example for our local area of species that duet, um, but there are species that sometimes will sing together, but it's not really a duet. Uh, we have, you know, some individuals that we have monitored in our long-term system uh, that we, so we know the sex of different individuals. And so we've heard um, uh, um, uh, sorry, we've, uh, we've heard female mountain chickadees singing, but they sing separately. They're not trying to, um, uh, duet, but they sometimes will sing and they'll just sing around each other. And so we know when a female sings sometimes in our system, which is quite rare for chickadee females to sing, um, uh, maybe not as rare as we think, but we haven't caught too many in there. All righty. Well, I have a question, Ben, and that's uh, about, would you say roughly, uh, um, what percentage of the bird sightings you see when you're out on a birding trip, uh, you have identified solely uh, auditorily by ear, not, you haven't seen them at all? Well, it depends on the season. And so this time of year, it's much more likely that that number or that percentage rather is going to be higher. Um, but for the spring, especially, and in the woods, sometimes when I'm checking, you know, nest boxes of chickadees in the woods and I'm walking around, I don't have time to actually get a look at species. And so if I'm on, it's 100% of the species sometimes. Um, if I'm wandering around the woods and actively birding, uh, especially this time of year, a lot of the times I hear birds first uh, and then know where to go look for them. And so, um, and so definitely, I would say 90% of birds, uh, especially if they're vocalizing and more likely to vocalize uh, in the summer, uh, spring and summer, probably like 90% of the birds uh, I hear first and then chase down. And I will say that, you know, a lot of my learning of um, uh, bird vocalizations has come from crawling through the woods, you know, so if I uh, hear a bird, hear something that I don't know, I record it, uh, and then I army crawl through the bushes to try to get a look at who's singing, and that is really helpful to learn. So spend time in the woods. Uh, spending time in the woods is also really important for uh, developing these, um, uh, all these memories. 
Exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, in fact, your experience of uh, identifying birds by ear uh, roughly matches my own experience. And uh, awesome. I also must echo what you have said. Uh, definitely, for those of you here, uh, if you want to learn more about birding uh, or identifying birds by ear, just go out there and practice. Just like, you know, musicians practice uh, or they uh, get better by practicing, uh, going out there, uh, exploring the woods or your local parks. That's how I got proficient at birding by ear. Yes. Oh, okay, we have uh, um, one last question uh, and that is, where is a good place to hear evening grouse speaks? Well, so even grouse speaks are a species that oftentimes is eruptive, with meaning that they follow resources. And so if there's, um, so they move around the mountains. In some years we have large amounts of evening grouse speaks around and sometimes we have sparing amounts. Uh, the best, uh, I mean, places to hear them that you will up your likelihood of hearing them are places like, uh, hiking in Galena, hiking uh, Hunter Creek Trail, uh, places that uh, coniferous forest comes down uh, to riparian areas. Um, uh, so other areas like Crystal Peak Park, Davis Creek Park are great places um, uh, just to seek them out to look for them. However, that being said, sometimes during large years, they just kind of show up. Um, uh, in places. So last year in April, I was just walking around Rancho San Rafael and there was an evening gross bee calling above my head. Uh, and so um, it's a species that is relatively unpredictable, but you can raise the likelihood of your chances of seeing one by spending time, like I said, near coniferous forest edges close to riparian areas. Wonderful, thank you. Well, here is uh, our final question, uh, which uh, I uh, is so good, uh, I couldn't pass it up. Uh, this person asks, great talk, Ben. Could you talk a little more about sharing recordings of vocalizations on platforms that will contribute to citizen science? Do you have a preferred platform to share your recordings on? Yeah, well, thanks, Amy, for your question. Um, I primarily share vocalizations on eBird. Uh, eBird, and there's really excellent resources that eBird gives for how to uh, upload and share sounds that you're wanting to share that will make them research quality for particular individuals that might wanna use them later for research projects. Um, so it's a well-managed, it's very specific to birds. Um, and Xenocanto is, is similar. I don't know, um, the, the reason one, one of the reasons why I prefer eBird is that it organizes my particular collection of sounds um, uh, extremely well. And that it particularly, it allows me to also visualize my sounds. So it saves them uh, and I can view them back as a spectrogram, which I view as really helpful. Other places that are good to upload vocalizations, especially if it's a hard to identify species is something, uh, are places like iNaturalist. But iNaturalist just uh, has a little bit of limitations as it's uh, meant to capture all diversity and not specifically avian diversity. And so um, uh, the application a lot of the times has the ability to record a sound, but sometimes that's of lower quality. So if you were to upload to a place like iNaturalist, I would suggest recording on one of the apps that I suggested, uh, editing the sound in a similar fashion to eBird's requirements and then uploading it there. But it doesn't have a visual component for the sound viewing. So then I just don't like it as much. So I don't share it, but it's also a very good resource that people look to. But Xenocanto and eBird are the two specific bird ones uh, and so those are the places that I share primarily, but every once in a while I do use iNaturalist as well. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, all righty. Well, I think that was all of our questions. Uh, once again, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and sharing your media, Ben. Uh, all of us are giving you a big round of applause and probably someone, uh, a lot of people at home are. Uh, 
uh, I, I once again, uh, for everyone who uh, tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube later on. And uh, um, please join us again next week. Uh, next week on Monday, we will have our final uh, bird drawing workshop with Jack Laws followed by another uh, Birds of Truckee Meadows workshop on Wednesday. This one will be Backyard Birds with Alan Gubanik. We all hope you uh, will join us then and have a good evening, everyone.